This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Ukraine's passed a contested bill overhauling the military draft. As a general warned lawmakers, Russian forces outnumbered Ukrainian troops tenfold in the east. The new measures seek to increase troop numbers by narrowing exemptions from military service, requiring eligible men to update their draft data with authorities, increasing compensation for volunteers, and allowing some people with convictions to serve. It also does not set an upper limit for wartime military service. The lawmakers, however, were forced to remove some of the harshest draft-dodging penalties after public backlash. The measure comes over two years into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and as Russian forces step up their attacks, Russia launched over 40 missiles and 40 drones at Ukrainian energy sources and critical infrastructure overnight Thursday, destroying power plants and underground gas storage facilities in five regions across Ukraine, including the largest power generator plant in the Kyiv region. For more, we're joined by Luke Mogelson, The New Yorker magazine's award-winning war correspondent. He is winning this year's prestigious George Polk Award that's being out today, uh, given out today in New York for magazine reporting, for his article, Two Weeks at the Front in Ukraine, for which he was embedded with Ukrainian troops. Uh, this is his third George Polk Award in four years. His new investigation is headlined Battling Under a Canopy of Drones. He's based in France, where he joins us from now. Luke, congratulations on these awards. Thank you so much for being with us again. Why don't we start off with your latest piece, Battling Under a Canopy of Drones. Why don't you lay out where you were in Ukraine and what's happening there today? Thanks, Amy. Um, I was embedded with a, an assault unit to the east of Kupiansk, uh, in the northeast of, of Ukraine. Um, and it's it's an access on the front that is under a lot of Russian pressure recently. Uh, Kupiansk is a city that's been heavily bombarded for months, and it was uh, evacuated. The, uh, the government ordered a mandatory evacuation back in August, and since then, uh, the situation has just kind of deteriorated uh, on the frontline trenches uh, to the east of the city. And the unit I was with uh, was a contingent of the first separate assault battalion. And they are tasked by uh, the general staff to shore up uh, sections of the front that are in danger of collapse or to retake uh, segments uh, that have already been lost to the Russians. Uh, and then to hand them back over to the regular Ukrainian infantry uh, and move on to the next uh, area on the front that needs their, uh, that, that requires uh, the same support from them. And so they've been really busy uh, lately, especially since the failure of last year's uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive to achieve a significant breakthrough. Uh, and basically, it's just been ongoing relentless uh, pressure from the Russian military all along the front uh, since that time. The subtitle of your piece, Battling Under a Canopy of Drones, the commander of one of Ukraine's most skilled units sent his men on a dangerous mission that required them to outmaneuver a swarm of aerial threats. So explain, bring us to the area um, and uh, what these men were dealing with, what's happening generally right now in Ukraine. But tell us the story of what they were doing. Sure. Well, they were tasked with uh, recapturing uh, a village called Tabaivka. And in order to do that, uh, they had to uh, essentially uh, s surround, flank, and attack from behind uh, a, a, Rush a, a group of Russian forces. Um, and they had to do it without being spotted by drones, Russian drones which is really difficult now because uh, they're, they, they're everywhere. And not just regular uh, surveillance drones, which have been a feature of the war uh, from its early days, but now, uh, especially in the, in the last six months, there's a new kind of drone that both the Ukrainians and the Russians have been fielding um, called uh, FPVs or first person view drones. 
And they're uh, kind of small, easily produced, uh, uh, very light and maneuverable drones that the pilots uh, uh, control with these kind of virtual reality looking like goggles, video goggles. And they can fly into trenches, they can fly into dugouts, they can go into buildings, they can chase down uh, fleeing vehicles, they can follow uh, squads and, and individual soldiers on foot and, and, and crash into them. And they're, they're, they're typically deployed as a kamikaze drones, so they'll have a payload of explosives attached to them. So that when they do just connect with their with their targets, uh, they can explode them with like extremely lethal uh, uh, precision. Uh, and so that has just rendered all troop movements along the front extremely difficult and dangerous, uh, especially in vehicles. So for a mission like this uh, that the first assault battalion was conducting, they actually had to wait until there was weather that impeded both the Russians and the Ukrainians from using drones. Uh, and in this case, because it was the winter, that meant snow. So they waited for a, a big whiteout blizzard and then went in uh, to this area called Tabaifka on foot in the snow without any overhead surveillance uh, or any option for a medevac or other, other kind of uh, support if they got into trouble. So it was a really tough, uh, and dangerous uh, mission, and the kind of mission that only a few units in the Ukrainian military now are, are capable of performing, uh, including these guys. I wanted to ask you about this latest news, Ukraine passing a contested bill overhauling the military draft. As a general warned lawmakers, Russian forces uh, outnumbered Ukrainian troops tenfold in the east. The new measure seeking to increase troop numbers by narrowing exemptions for military service, requiring eligible men to update their draft data with authorities, increasing compensation for volunteers, allowing some people uh, with convictions to serve, um, among other things. Can you talk about who is fighting on the front and who is back in Kyiv and the rest of Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, to the extent that one can generalize, uh, in my experience, uh, which is anecdotal, but I have spent a fair amount of time on the front and with frontline units, um, it's predominantly uh, working class men um, from rural areas or smaller villages where the draft is being more aggressively um, more aggressively carried out than in places like uh, Kyiv, where the Ukrainian elite and, and, and wealthier and more educated uh, uh, class, classes and citizens uh, tend to live, or Lviv or Odessa. Um, and certainly in the actual trenches, because you have to keep in mind, uh, there's there's the military, and then there's the army, and then there's within the army the units that are actually in the trenches, which tend to be uh, infantry infantrymen, uh, and those those guys uh, certainly I would say are are uh, much more much more. Uh, have a much higher proportion of of, uh, of uh, lower class uh, men and lower economic status uh, 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 Ukrainians. And so you have this contested bill because it would require more people who are in more comfortable areas of Ukraine. You write about how uh, people in the capital and other places are more and more comfortable. People on the front lines plunged into uh, greater and greater hell. Yeah, I mean, you can really feel the the gap between the two worlds widening um, because the front line is just becoming more and more lethal, uh, more and more uh, miserable uh, and, and, and difficult to, to maintain. And meanwhile, Kyiv, uh, Lviv, Dnipro, places like this are becoming, um, in a lot of ways, uh, more normal, um, at least for now, you know, once the air defenses start 
giving out because they're already being depleted and not replaced, uh, that could change. Um, but but these days, uh, Kyiv is, it, it's easy to forget the war uh, in Kyiv. Talk about how the Ukrainian government is limiting coverage of the war. And you've said yourself that Ukrainian soldiers desire to share their experiences with journalists, despite official restrictions. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's always like that. And by the way, just uh, in reference to your last question, it's, it's not just Ukraine, where you have uh, typically poor and uh, less educated uh, uh, citizens doing uh, most of the fighting. I mean, that's the case in, in any country, in any war that I've experienced, including uh, America. Uh, certainly uh, America during the global war on, t on terrorism. Right. And you've served in Afghanistan and Syria. I mean, I say serve. You've written about, um, <laughs> you know, the U.S. invasion in Iraq as well. Yeah. And it's the same. It's the same with, uh, uh, with regards to the coverage. Um, soldiers uh, on the front are always, almost always, uh, eager to have their stories told, their names recorded, uh, what they're doing, what they're suffering, what they're living through, uh, chronicled. Um, and, and witnessed. Um, it's extremely uh, difficult uh, to fight a war, and it's even more difficult to do that, uh, to, do, to fight a war in obscurity, I think. Uh, and so, in my experience, uh, uh, frontline soldiers uh, are always happy to have uh, journalists around. Um, it's the brass, it's the press officers, the public affairs officers, uh, the colonels and above, uh, back in the rear, who tend to uh, tend to uh, obfuscate and uh, create obstacles for for the press, um, because they're more interested in you know they're they're less interested in in an honest uh, portrayal of the reality and more in in a kind of in political uh, narratives. Again, not just in Ukraine, but in any war with with any government. If there isn't a negotiation, do you see any war, any end in sight, Luke Mogelson, to what you've described as this war of attrition? Well, the end would be one side or the other uh, winning uh, in the way that it's going. That would probably be Russia. So, no, I mean, the, I think everybody understands that at some point there needs to be a negotiation. Uh, absolutely. And the soldiers uh, understand that and are very uh, forthright uh, and, and honest about that fact. Well, Luke Mogelson, want to thank you for being with us. Longtime war correspondent for The New Yorker has reported from Ukraine, Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq. We'll link to your new piece, Battling Under a Canopy of Drones. Today, though he's in France, he's receiving the prestigious George Polk Award for his piece, Two Weeks at the Front in Ukraine. It's his third George Polk Award in four years.